Hello and welcome to Midweek Connection on August 11th, 2013 here at First Presbyterian Church. My name is Pastor Joel. And I'm Pastor Natalie. And we are going to do our daily lectionary reading for today and talk about it and see what we might come up with, what uh, God might be revealing to us. So uh, let's open in a word of prayer. Gracious Lord, thank you for this opportunity to be uh, in your word today. I ask, Lord, that you would reveal to us what would be good and useful for us and that we would be transformed by it. I thank you and praise you. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. Starting today with Psalm 94. 84. That's what I meant, 84. I've got it. In the year 2023, not 2013. Did I say 2013? (laughs) You did. August 11th, 2023. (laughs) Psalm 84. Okay, we got it. Not only am I deaf and blind, I am in a different time. (laughs) Here I am. Blast from the past. Anyway, Psalm 84. Thank you. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, indeed it faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young. At your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Happy are those who live in your house, ever singing your praise. Happy are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. Their early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. The God of gods will be seen in Zion. O Lord, God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Behold our shield, O God, look on the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than live in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. He bestows favor and honor. No good thing does the Lord withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, happy is everyone who trusts in you. Psalm 148. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. He established them forever and ever. He fixed their bounds, which cannot be passed. Praise the Lord from the earth, you sea monsters and all deeps fire and hail, snow and frost, stormy wind fulfilling his command, mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle, creeping things and flying birds, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and women alike, old and young together. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His glory is above earth and heaven, He has raised up a horn for his people. Praise for all his faithful, for the people of Israel who are close to him. Praise the Lord. Our Hebrew scripture reading today is from 2 Samuel chapter 12. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord, and the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, There were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. He brought it up, and it grew up with him and with his children. It used to eat of his meager fare, and drink from his cup, and lie in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was loath to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him, but he took the poor man's lamb and prepared that for the guest who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. He said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. He shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. I anointed you king over Israel, and I rescued you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your bosom. 
and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have added as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with a sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house, for you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, I will raise up trouble against you from within your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this very son. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan said to David, Now the Lord has put away your sin. You shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child that is born to you shall die. And Nathan went to his house. And Acts chapter 19, verses 21 through 41. Now after these things had been accomplished, Paul resolved in the spirit to go through Macedonia and Achaia, and then to go on to Jerusalem. He said, After I have gone there, I must also see Rome. So he sent two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, to Macedonia, while he himself stayed for some time longer in Asia. About that time, no little disturbance broke out concerning the way. A man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought no little business to the artisans. These he gathered together, and the workers of the same trade, and said, Men, you know that we get our wealth from this business. You also see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost the whole of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and drawn away a considerable number of people by saying that gods made with hands are not gods. And there is danger not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be scorned, and she will be deprived of her majesty that brought all Asia and the world to worship her. When they heard this, they were enraged and shouted, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. The city was filled with confusion, and people rushed together to the rushed together to the theater, dragging with them Gaius and um, Aristarchus, Macedonians, who were Paul's travel companions. Paul wished to go into the crowd, but the disciples would not let him. Even some officials of the province of Asia, who were friendly to him, sent him a message urging him not to venture into the theater. Meanwhile, some were shouting one thing, some another, for the assembly was in confusion, and most of them did not know why they had come together. Some of the crowd gave instructions to Alexander, whom the Jews had pushed forward, and Alexander motioned for silence and tried to make a defense before the people. But when they recognized that he was a Jew, for about two hours all of them shouted in unison, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. But when the town clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, Citizens of Ephesus, who is there that does not know the city of the Ephesians is the temple keeper of the great Artemis and of the statue that fell from heaven? Since these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rash. You have brought these men here who are neither temple robbers nor blasphemers of our goddess. If, therefore, Demetrius and the artisans with him have a complaint against anyone, the courts are open, and there are proconsuls. Let them bring charges there against one another. If there is anything further you want to know, it must be settled in the regular assembly, for we are in danger of being charged with rioting today, since there is no cause that we can give to justify this commotion. When he had said this, he, was, he dismissed the assembly. Our gospel reading today is from Mark chapter 9, verses 14 through 29. When they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them, some scribes arguing with them. When the whole crowd saw Jesus, they were immediately overcome with awe, and they ran forward to greet him. He asked them, What are you arguing about with them? Someone from the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought you my son. He has a spirit that makes him unable to speak, and whenever it seizes him, it dashes him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. And I asked your disciples to cast it out, but they could not do so. 
Jesus answered them, You faithless generation, how much longer must I be among you? How much longer must I put up with you? Bring him to me. So they brought the boy to Jesus. When the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the father, How long has this been happening to him? And he said, From childhood. It has often cast him into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you are able to do anything, have pity on us and help us. Jesus said to him, If you are able, all things can be done for the one who believes. Immediately, the father of the child cried out, I believe, help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You spirit that keeps this boy from speaking and hearing, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. After crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out, and the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he was able to stand. When he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? He said to them, This kind can come out only through prayer. And back to our Psalms, Psalm 25. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be put to shame. Do not let my enemies exult over me. Do not let those who wait for you be put to shame. Let them be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me, for your goodness sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his decrees. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. Who are they that fear the Lord? He will teach them the way that they should choose. They will abide in prosperity, and their children shall possess the land. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he makes his covenant known to them. My eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he will pluck my feet out of the net. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. Relieve the troubles of my heart and bring me out of my distress. Consider my affliction and my trouble and forgive all my sins. Consider how many are my foes and with what violent hatred they hate me. O oh, guard my life and deliver me. Do not let me be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. Redeem Israel, O oh God, out of all its troubles. And our final psalm today is Psalm 40. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the desolate pit, out of the miry bog, and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Happy are those who make the Lord their trust, who do not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after false gods. You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts toward us. None can compare with you. Were I to proclaim and tell of them, they would be more than can be counted. Sacrifice and offering you do not desire, but you have given me an open ear. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, Here I am. In the scroll of the book it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. I have told the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation. See, I have not restrained my lips, as you know, O Lord. I have not hidden your saving help within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from the great congregation. Do not, O Lord, withhold your mercy from me. Let your steadfast love and your faithfulness keep me safe forever. 
for evils have encompassed me without number. My iniquities have overtaken me until I cannot see. They are more than the hairs of my head, and my heart fails me. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Let all those be put to shame and confusion who seek to snatch away my life. Let those be turned back and brought to dishonor who desire my hurt. Let those be appalled because of their shame who say to me, Aha, aha. But may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say continually, Great is the Lord. As for me, I am poor and needy, but the Lord takes thought of me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, O oh my God. These are the words of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. So the second Samuel, yes. David and uh, Bathsheba and mm -hmm. David's killing of Uriah and Nathan calling him out on it, the judgment that comes. Um, I think regularly we want to go to Psalm 51 to talk about that. And maybe that'll actually be tomorrow's Psalm. I haven't looked ahead, but uh, right. with David's repentance, because that is specifically labeled, you know, this is the psalm that David wrote after the prophet Nathan came to him after he'd gone into Bathsheba. So that makes sense. But mm -hmm. I'm, I'm uh, the other psalms that we did today, uh, I'm thinking, you know, Psalm 25 and Psalm 40, these last two psalms that we read, both again, psalms of David. And um, I don't know when these psalms might have been written. You know, were they written while uh, you know David was being chased by Saul, or when David was just anointed king, or whenever they might happen to be? Um, but I was thinking, what is pretty fascinating about the Psalms and the life of David is what we see is a uh, an ongoing transformation of his life where he was called and anointed by God for a great purpose and that uh, the all of the you know stories from first Samuel that kind of play into this uh, to that story and we see David having um, opportunities for self-reflection and we see him doing these things and we see all throughout the Psalms where he's crying out to the Lord, search my heart, know my heart, other Psalms that we've read, I think even ones that we've read um, on Sunday, the one about, you'll find no wickedness within me, and no transgressions, no transgressions on, my on my lips, all these things, and, and I wonder sometimes if the Psalms are descriptions of where we are at particular times, and maybe even uh, indicative of a greater need for self-reflection that sometimes we can think of ourselves as a little on the righteous side. You know, maybe no, no wickedness in me whatsoever. And because there's no wickedness in me, clearly God's on my side. Um, but Psalm 25 and Psalm 40 especially, it's, there seems to be a recognition that there is sin within right. David. And he's asking for it to be cleansed, and that's a good thing, you know. And right, and right. And then he does what he does, <sighs> and messes up, and right. In complete and total disobedience to everything that God had said, and the the Samuel passage that where Nathan is re, uh, reminding David of all of the things that God has done for David, right. and yet David does this thing that demonstrates that he's despising God and the blessings that God brings. And and if I hadn't given you enough, I would have given that's you more. A, yes. I would have given you more. You didn't have to do this. Right. But I think, and, I, and David touched on this on Sunday as well when he was talking about Jacob, but I think when we look at some of the people in the Old Testament who God has used in order to um, carry out his will... They're not perfect people. They're not good people. I mean, this it's, there's, it's there's nothing good about any of this. And yet, 
um, there's obviously a consequence, you know, I, you know, David doesn't just split off with nothing. Right. Um, there will be a heavy price to pay, but yet God remains faithful to the promises that he has made to David, and he still finds a way for David to carry out his will mm -hmm. despite all of the mess-ups. He doesn't walk away from him. But I think, too, what we can learn from that is we don't look at all of these people of the Old Testament that God used to carry out his will and go, well, I could never, God couldn't use me because I could never be that good, or God couldn't use me because I couldn't just fill in whatever blank that you want to fill in. Well, he took some pretty bad circumstances and used these people in spite of all of that or despite of that. Mm -hmm. And so I think when we when we have this relationship with God, when we feel a call or we feel that God is pulling us to do something, um, you know, we can't discount it. Well, he, he could never use me for this, that, or the other because clearly he can. Mm -hmm. And so I think sometimes when we look at people of the Old Testament and in their humanity, mm -hmm. we can see that our humanity doesn't discount us from being able to carry out the things that God's calling us to do. It doesn't right. disqualify us right. from doing the things that God's asking us to do, um, even when we don't live in obedience or right. um, hopefully not downright wickedness. But <laughs> Well, there's that. There's that. There's but, that. And, and that's, yes, I, I very much agree with, with everything you just said, Natalie. That's, um, and how interesting that David's like, He's angry. He's like, oh, this man will pay for this fourfold. And it's like, here's the mirror. <laughs> right? Here's the mirror. It's like, oh, ooh, how humbling would that have been? So maybe and, uh, we should talk about what I, what I just said. And, and, but, and, and terrifying, even. Even terrifying. Uh, right. Um, and I think one of the, the differences that if we remember back to the uh, when Saul was confronted with his sins... Saul would frequently make an excuse about it. Ah, oh, you know, when you were delayed in coming, Samuel, I had to do this. The people were pressing in on me. All this, that, the other thing. Right. David doesn't, at least in this place, doesn't right. um, deny his sin. He admits it. I've sinned. And, and in that, even with the consequences that you had already alluded to, the consequences that are happening, um, the very severe consequences, even right. the death of the child, that the, uh, the sword would not depart from David's mm -hmm. household, that uh, we know later on in the story that um, David's sons uh, end up getting David's wives, and you're like, wait, all, wait, all the things, all the things, that all the things. But, but God said, you know, you will not die. And like you said, God will continue to fulfill the covenant that God has made, right. even though David had broken faith. And, right. and I think that is um, challenging to us because how often in our lives do, do we just want to cut people off? You know, right. they, they've done something to offend us, we yeah. cut them off. There's no more relationship. We're out of here, you know. Right. And, and I get it. Some people do really damaging and wicked things to others and right. and and this the forgiveness does not always mean that there won't be consequences in fact there are consequences right. and so i think in the christian church all too often when we think about forgiveness that we think oh everyone's just got to be nice and kind of polite and it's like well okay but it doesn't solve the woundedness and it right. doesn't bring restitution and I think that is where frequently even within our relationships you know there can be forgiveness but it takes a long time to rebuild trust, trust. and it takes you right. know there has to be some sort of restitution in order for real reconciliation to happen right and forgiveness doesn't mean that the wrong is undone. It doesn't make what right. they did right. Right. And so I think sometimes that is that is a misconception too. If if you forgive someone that well then you're saying that what they did was okay. Right. I, I don't think that that's what we're doing because they're being 
you know, forgiveness is because something was wrong. Yeah. And so yeah. it doesn't say that what was done was right. It just, you move beyond that. Right. So trying to figure out how to get the Acts and the Mark passage into that, you know, sometimes yeah. it's easy to, you know, I was like, yeah, Second Samuel, right, we can talk we about can that. We can talk We're about good that, that for a while, but how do we, yes. But the uh, you know, Acts 19 is interesting because we have very little, um, we have very little in this passage being said by anyone who's a believer. There's a big chunk of stuff given to this uh, silversmith, Demetrius, and mm-hmm. then there's this other chunk given to the uh, the uh, what's his yeah, name? the right town there. clerk, you mm-hmm. know, verse thirty five. So clearly, Demetrius and this town clerk are not followers of Jesus. Yet right. they've got a lot to say in this passage about how does how does the the good news of Jesus Christ actually impact with people's lives? And I think I think there are times when we we want to think, oh, well, it's just Jesus meek and mild, and it's just going to be, um, you know, your whole life is going to turn around and be better and things. But I think on the, on the, you know, on the cosmic scale, absolutely, yes. But within this context, uh, the, the Demetrius was, and his way of life was right, being threatened. It was shaking up this... Right? This, I make statues of Artemis, and Paul is preaching that there is no God but one God, and he, you can't make an idol of him. And so uh, what's interesting is you know, the town clerk's comment, well, these people aren't blaspheming Artemis, because remember, so many of them were... Uh, polytheists just oh right. tell me about your new god well that's great you know we'll make a little statue for him too and, right uh, that's fine but Demetrius is like wait no something's going on people are no longer buying my, my stat yeah they're not buying my product anymore they are becoming Christians and and so my livelihood is threatened mm-hmm. and so what's fascinating to me is you get this huge crowd together and it wasn't say for two hours they chanted you know great is Artemis of the Ephesians you know, but sometimes people in our worship service, well, you know, hey, we got to go. It's a whole hour, you know. We, Your time is up. The time is up. We can, we, you know, wow, pagans are cheering for two hours. And it's like, and some of them don't even know why they're there. Right. <laughs> Just like. Right. So, um, so the gospel message comes in that there is one God and Jesus Christ, you have faith in him and you can have forgiveness. And the message doesn't change, but everybody's response to it is going to be different. Right. And it doesn't seem as if you can really have indifference. You are either drawn to it or you are repulsed by it. Right. And there there's is, not really a fence line not, that you can walk. Right. You just kind of go, oh, okay. Right. It's, are you getting closer to Jesus or are you getting further from him? Mm-hmm. And, and I was reading something the other day that talked about if we truly want to be uh, obedient to what God's calling us to do, we have to be asking ourselves the question, what in my life needs to die in order to do what God wants done? And the message is available for Demetrius, right. and he's not willing to give up his livelihood. Right. He, is, he does not trust that God can provide for him a different method of living you know within a physical thing right. doesn't believe it he's going to hold on to what he's got mm-hmm. and and rile everybody up in opposition against it so i just i thought that was fascinating uh and then if we jump over to the mark passage obviously jesus and uh, uh peter james and john coming down off the mount of transfiguration and they come into this crowd this crowd scene and there's argument going on and it's like wait there's an argument. Wait, wait where are we seeing this? Everyone's always, <laughs> Everybody's always arguing. Everybody's always arguing all the time. Wait, wait, how come Why we, we all how come we along? couldn't cast them out? Now they're, well, anyway, so they're, they're arguing, arguing, arguing. And uh, so even the disciples argue. And uh, and this interaction, it's, it's such a beautiful interaction with the Father. Jesus taking the time, listening to the Father. You know, and the father's like, if you can, you know, you can do anything, you know, have pity on us and help us. And Jesus says, you know, if you are able, and it's it's a striking comment. Mm-hmm. All things can be done for the one who believes. Really? 
I believe helped my unbelief. Um, uh, yeah. And I wonder, I feel that way sometimes. Like I know God's promises. I've read them, I've studied them, I've practiced them. And sometimes I'm like, mm. but I want, or I don't understand, or well, I want to go difficult. this way, and he's calling me this way. Mm -hmm. You know, I believe, help my unbelief, and Jesus cast him out. And then that final thing, they ask him privately, why could we not cast it out? And Jesus said, this kind can only come out through prayer. And the question was, who prayed in the passage? The Father. And what was his prayer? Help my unbelief. I believe, I believe. Help, help my unbelief. unbelief. So all of the things, you know, throwing it back to 2 Samuel, you know, David, again, David, God, God had given David everything. Right. And maybe he was like, nah, maybe he's not going to give me what I want tomorrow. <laughs> maybe if he had prayed, I believe, help my unbelief. Um, or Demetrius, you know, gosh, my livelihood might be taken away, you know. Mm. I believe, help my unbelief. Right. <laughs> no, I know. I'm looking right here at the very beginning of the passage. You know, you were talking about that they're arguing. You know, when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd, and some scribes were arguing with them. And then they saw Jesus. They're immediately overcome with awe. They run to him to greet him. What are you arguing about? Teacher, I brought you my son. He has the spirit. Whenever it sees this, all this stuff. And so, like, what were they arguing that were they arguing they should be able to or why aren't you or if you, it's just interesting just you know what what was the actual argument there um yeah. and, and in that argument is that where that you know lack of faith right was there just interesting. well yeah verse 19 you faithless generation how much longer must i be among you how much longer must i put up with you um you think he still says that about us um, I hope not. Right. <laughs> it's like, you know, I don't know, maybe maybe Jesus in his, you know, perfect humanity um, gets frustrated. <laughs> it seems like it. Right, anyway. right. Yeah, it's been a long day. I'm up, I've been up on the mountain. I've been talking with Moses. I've been talking with Elijah. Peter and James and John are being dumb again up here, too. <laughs> It's just like, uh, together. Uh, you know, this massive experience. It was great for me. And really, come on, cast out the demon. Right. And maybe, maybe it's like, why, why couldn't they cast it out? Maybe, maybe this is Jesus trying to remind his disciples that they themselves didn't have the power they was, needed to pray. Right. Because they'd been doing healing earlier. You right. Know, uh, they've been sent out. They've mm -hmm. been, they've been, um, They've been doing the work. But sometimes maybe we do the work and we get used to doing it and then we start thinking it's about our work as opposed to the work that Jesus does. Right. Credit is not um, given where credit should be given. We try to take that. And... Yeah. Hmm. All right. Well, All right. you want to close us right. in prayer? Or do you got something else to add? No. I just was going to look at one thing that um, I don't know where it was. Just the Father, you know. Um, I believe, help my unbelief. As for me, I am poor and needy, written by David as a king. How many times do we look at ourselves as poor and needy and unbelieving? And that is exactly where we are. But the Lord takes thought for each of us. So. All right. All right. Gracious Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you 
for being a God that is bigger than our doubts and our unbelief and that in your mercy that you do um, hear us and you do have a thought for us and that you do answer us and respond to us when we cry out to you um, even in our unbelief when we are poor and needy and we need you and our spirits are weak um, our hearts are weak and um, you are the one who can lift us up and that you can um, draw us into you and I just pray that we lean into you and that we may have obedient hearts and that we listen to your call and that we trust that what you have for us is good and that your plan is good and that we um, we follow that in obedience and in Christ's name I pray these things amen amen all right everybody thanks for joining us have a great weekend take care bye-bye